Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, it's, um, I, mean, I apologize to begin with for my fancy dress. I came straight from Evensong. Um, I want to congratulate you all for, as it were, coming, making your way through the series um, and coming to, sadly, what is going to be the last of this series on art, the spiritual senses and the liturgical arts. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I am looking forward to this evening tremendously, Jim, as I suspect um, everyone else here is. So thank you, um, Jim, for what I know is going to be a very stimulating and informative lecture. But I think on behalf of all of us, I'd like to say a public thank you to both of you for um, the entire liturgical arts project and for um, your work in the studios. And I know you've had lots of people coming in to talk to you today, so much so that they were beginning to get a little bit worried about getting on with some work. <laughs> Actually, that's quite a good thing, but we do want you to be able to finish your projects. But Jim, thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say about the spiritual senses and transformation. So thank you. Well, my thanks to Vanessa uh, as canon treasurer, as ever. Uh, Vanessa stepped into the project and uh, has been wonderful in support of our project here, as has the whole cathedral. So I'd like to restate the gratitude that we have to the cathedral uh, for that welcome and that ongoing support and encouragement in the project here, which continues until the end of March, 31st of March, towards the beginning, first day of April. And uh, we also have a study day coming up on the 12th of March, at which the bishop is now speaking also, and um, that's something to which we much look forward to. Um, there's still availability for the study day, I think, fair to say, Vanessa, Vanessa say, agree there. So um, my thanks too to the Bishop Otter Trust and the scholarship that the Trust has made available that has allowed me to come here and to be part of the project. My thanks as ever to, to Martin and to, to Aidan. Aidan Hart will be here. I'll mention him actually in the course of this talk. He'll be here. Uh, is it is this next week, isn't it? Teaching some people from of, of his students, the Princess Foundation School of Traditional Arts here uh, on site. In fact, in this room um, for for next week, and people can drop in and and see uh, what he's doing there um, and how he works. And we three work in the studio together in Shrewsbury. So the lectures are, uh, as, as written here, um, for those who haven't been uh, here for the first two, I'll go th through quickly what they were about and pick up some of the discussion that followed them as well, and I hope that's uh, helpful. Um, is there anything that anyone wants to raise before I do start or anything that people might want to pick up in the course of this lecture as we go through to the end. So there'll be plenty of time for discussion at the end and I'll aim as before for about 40 minutes and hope that works for you. Um, so as I say, a quick summary of the lectures to date, the first two on the 1st and the 8th, in a way that I hope is hospitable to those here for the first time. Uh, we looked in the first lecture uh, in some of the importance of embodiment. Um, the importance of the body uh, in art, in the church, um, because of the incarnation, because Christ became flesh, became human flesh. And I made a distinction in the first uh, lecture between gallery art, threshold art, and liturgical art. Gallery art belonging to the gallery for display. Threshold art, in this context, being art that has Christian content, but isn't necessarily for the church itself and the church's worship, that being liturgical art, liturgy simply meaning public worship. So the focus of these lectures is on liturgical art, art within the church's worship. Um, and on the point of embodiment, I thought uh, within that lecture, I thought to just explore that here. There's an image from the first lecture. Uh, Christ became flesh, but he did not remain flesh. Christ became flesh in the incarnation, but through his crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, presence with us in the spirit, he transformed the flesh as he transformed the will, the mind, the whole person of each human, should they be in union with him. So flesh is a necessary start. It remains so. But it is necessarily not the end. There is transformation 
We do not remain in flesh. And we'll have something more on that today. About what a person does come, become eventually, it's very hard to say. St. Paul doesn't say a lot where he does describe this in the first letter to the people in Corinth. And if you want to pursue that in the 15th chapter, he talks about becoming um, a spiritual body. We don't know quite what that is. He doesn't spell it out. And therefore, nor will I try in the second lecture, uh, we looked at specifically Christian characteristics uh, of liturgical making. And we looked at 20th century European and 12th century Chinese painters. We engaged with comparative discussions that led to an outline of a specifically Christian view in which Christ is all in all, a world bright with Christ. And I suggested just as a thought experiment there to put aside the concept or the notion of Christian tradition, just, as I say, is a thought experiment, experiment and no more, so that we could re-envision that concept of tradition. And while we in the Art of Worship project here vitally see ourselves as working within tradition, we're not simply copyists and we're not restorers. Everything that we make there is new. And rather, what I wanted to say, and we ended up getting to at the end of that lecture, is that tradition is, as it says, the handing on, tradito, the passing on, of something like fire, uh, of the spirit, uh, the passing on of a spiritual vision. It's a hope-filled, creative, risk-filled task that a person has wherever in the church they're responsible for handing on the tradition. And in what I've said to date, I've tried to adhere to a tradition that is shared by Anglican, Roman Catholic, Orthodox alike, and others in the wider churches. And that is to say, the one tradition uh, of the church. And I focused a good deal on theologians who I haven't mentioned by name, but are there. And if you wish to follow it up any time, I could. And they are the likes of uh, Gregory of Nyssa, Pseudo Dionysius, Maximus the Confessor. These are uh, theologians from the 4th, the 6th, the 8th centuries uh, who undergird a lot of what I'm saying. So I'll leave that said as implicit and we'll continue with them a bit today. But I won't mention their name and I won't mention their writings. So that much for uh, a quick reminder of the lectures to date and an attempt respectfully and thankfully uh, to respond to some points in the discussions that followed further here. Today I want to first share a feel for what's going on in the field of the spiritual senses currently, where people are researching, what they're looking at, what the questions are, and then from that, taking those questions to go into our main task, which is to consider how art in the church's liturgy, in the church's worship, can stimulate and encourage the spiritual senses. Now, roughly speaking, there are two approaches to the spiritual senses in the literature. One goes chronologically through time, and the other goes thematically through the senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, etc. Uh, and I'll briefly consider each and try and uh, lift out of each some insights that are valuable in taking us further. So firstly, there's a chronological approach. Many people here will start inevitably with the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and then into the New Testament. And then they'll often go straight to a figure called, and I did mention him here in relation to the Song of Songs in the first lecture, Origin of Alexandria, uh, who's a controversial figure in theology, um, partly because he took a, along notions of something like a reincarnation and uh, other elements of human existence and projected supernatural existence that don't fit with core Christian tradition. Nonetheless, he translated... Um, a verse, uh, chapter 2 of verse 5 in Proverbs, as relating to a divine sense. It was a Greek translation of the Hebrew. Now that translation, um, a bit arcane as it may sound to hear it now, set a whole trajectory of thinking about this notion of a divine sense. You know, what is that? Uh, others took it on. Gregory of Nyssa mentioned Dionysius, the Areopagite, have mentioned but there wasn't anything set as a sort of teaching of the spiritual senses in Christian tradition until something like the 11th and the 12th centuries. What we get until then is 
uh, lots of different perspectives on different elements of the human constitution, uh, what might be involved in heightened or transformed uh, perception in the spirit. Uh, I'm going to keep with that early project of seeing things very much here and there rather than trying to produce a systematic account so that no one would think to expect to leave with a sense of, oh, I know what the spiritual senses are. It's, that's not the case. But we can get some glimpses here and there of something, I think, of, I hope, of the excitement of the possibilities of human transformation. If you did want to follow this up, there's a book that's uh, edited by Sarah Coakley and Paul Galvariliuk, um, called The Spiritual Senses, Perceiving God in Western Christianity. There's much writing on Eastern Christianity already in place. Um, I can say more about that. That's the cover on the left. Um, Paul Gravelyuk's also got a great set of interviews with people uh, that is on YouTube. And if you just type in the Spiritual Perception Project into any search engine, uh, you'll find his work there. He goes through, including Sarah Coakley, but many others as well. I mean, I think some seven or eight others at least in a building number. Uh, discussing different uh, advantages on the spiritual senses. Now, that's a chronological account. There is also then a thematic account of the spiritual senses that I earlier mentioned, going through the senses uh, one by one. And this approach, too, raises a number of interesting difficulties, I think. For a start, uh, how many senses are there? Many begin with the Aristotelian five Aristotle said there's hearing, sight, touch, taste, smell. Um, and that's, as we might think, an accepted number of senses. But further to these, a psychologist uh, has recently suggested a sixth proprioception. Um, those who've uh, broken a limb, a, a leg, ankle, or something will be perhaps familiar from physio, talking about proprioception, the need for balance and re-establishing balance uh, of the whole person, um, hence the image there on the right. But uh, also, I think, interesting to discuss here as later what non-human animals also experience of the senses and also possibly the spiritual senses, and we can perhaps raise that uh, in discussion later. So proprioception, the, body, the body's ability to sense movement, action, location. We'll pick this up later. Uh, and then what perhaps of telepathy is another sense. The Desert Fathers were said to have a telepathic capacity in sayings that uh, gave accounts of their lives. Uh, recently, Rupert Sheldrake, a scientist, has written uh, in offering evidence-based research for the notion that dogs know when their owners are coming home at a distance outside ordinary sensory capacity. And he's published on a sense of being stared at. Martin and I were discussing the other day, I hope it's fair to say this, Martin, that sometimes you just get a sense in the workshop in the North Transept that someone's, someone's watching you. And that's what we're there for. That's good. And that's fine. But you just get that sense you turn around and there's someone there. And, you, and of course, that's not scientific. That's anecdotal. There's no control and so on. But um, the sense of being stared at or the sense of um, anticipating a phone call and who the person is and this kind of thing um, fits with an endeavour to discover whether or not, and I made no statement on this whatsoever, but whether or not this might be a possible extension of simply these five uh, senses. Well, there's another interesting uh, question that arises with regard to the standard five, and that's the extent to which they sometimes cross over and overlap as senses. And they do some, uh, in some particularly striking ways with people who are diagnosed with having uh, synesthesia, syn, Greek, meaning together, aesthesia, sense, or aesthesis, sense, joint uh, sensation, uh, joint perception. Synesthesia seems to have multiple forms, uh, for example, colour especially, uh, and sound is one that uh, Olivier Messiaen uh, had, something like a bi-directional sound colour synesthesia. Um, and just as an aside, our assistant cathedral organist uh, here, Tim Revald, uh, he produced a wonderful uh, recital of uh, Messiaen's Nativity of the Lord recently. And then in, in public preface to that, 
he made an analogy between Messiaen's layering of music, his nativity score on the left, um, with the work um, that artists can engage with, visual artists can engage with in uh, layering and layering and layering the surface of, for example, a, a tempera painting on layer upon layer upon layer of plaster. And interestingly, Tim suggested that w one of the uh, necessary successful points, if there is to be one, is knowing where to stop layering as well. At what point those layers are sufficient to perform the complete sound that works for people. So then there's another question, uh, further to these questions so far, and that's supposing there are then five, six, or however many senses of a physical kind, is there then just one spiritual sense? Do they come together in a unified spiritual total perception? Or is there somehow a spiritual sense that maps on to each physical sense in such a way that we have five, six, seven, and however many spiritual senses as well? Now that's not a question I think we can expect any straightforward answer to. And the reason why I don't think we can expect a straightforward answer to that is that the very transformation of the senses as we will come to investigate them here takes the human into a transcendent realm beyond ordinary functioning, beyond sensual functioning or sensible functioning, and so beyond the realm of empirical psychology. And if we wanted to pick up on that in the relation of cognitive psychology, empirical psychology, and the religious experience or spiritual experience, we can think of say, figure William James and pick up on him later. He was uh, an early medic um, in Harvard, early psychologist in the States, and provided a grounding for cognitive psychology in the States and has interesting thoughts about that. So but we will be confirmed, uh, concerned with uh, divinization, this making divine of the human, transcendent to ordinary functioning today. And I want to state as a key principle for this, uh, for our consideration, um, something written by Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is a Roman Catholic theologian of the last century, 20th century. It was the 20th century, wasn't it? Yeah. Even the most vital and profound Christian experience, he wrote, cannot simply be understood with the categories of psychology. And this is because Christ himself is the primary subject. And man, or woman and man, humanity, we might say, participates in Christ's archetypal experience only by being raised out of him or herself. So I'm going to come back to that throughout. That's an underlying principle of what I want to present here. And I want to turn now to precisely such an ecstatic, a going out of oneself, uh, participation in Christ's experience in the Gospels. And first... Uh, in the transfiguration. And this consideration of the transfiguration will lead us into consideration of art in the liturgy, uh, as promised. So the transfiguration. For those unfamiliar with the event, and we'll come back to this image of it, uh, I'll go to the shortest gospel account, which is from Mark. They're all pretty short. Um, there, there are accounts in Matthew, Mark and Luke, none in John, um, and they're pretty similar. And it reads as follows, as you can see. Six days later, we needn't worry about that, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. In each of these accounts from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is first this vision. Jesus appears to the apostles in dazzling light. And then the apostles experience this overshadowing cloud and they hear a voice. So first the vision, then the overshadowing and a voice. And then after this, according to Matthew, they fell on their faces. 
But that's the literal translation of the, the word. They fell out, you know, flat on their faces. Now, there are interesting parallels here with Paul's uh, experience of conversion. So, as we might recall, or if we don't know, Saul became Paul as a result of a conversion experience, which is accounted for in the Acts of the Apostles. He's near Damascus. And just very briefly, I want to um, invite us to hear what's said there. It's only a couple of sentences. As Saul was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So in this case of Saul, to become Paul, like the transfiguration, first, there's a dazzling, and for, for Paul, a literally blinding light, and then a voice, here for Paul, the voice of Christ, first the light, then the voice, and then, including for Paul too, a falling to the ground. Now, I want to take these further. So in the transfiguration and St. Paul's conversion, a seeing the light, a hearing the voice, and a falling. And perhaps that falling is that additional sense. Could it be that proprioception? They lose the balance. You know, they lose their ability to see. So too they lose their ability to sense their movement, the place of their body as located in the space. And they fall to the ground. Well, what about other people around these events? What did they experience? In the case of transfiguration, there were no others. There was just Peter, James, John, and Jesus, and Moses and Elijah separately. But I sometimes wonder, what, what, if, what if the animals around, what are those sheep or the goats around on the mountain? They went up the mountain. What might they have seen as non-human perceiving animals? Would they have seen a physical light? Or is it just an interior light? Or is it both? Or is it a physical light that becomes quite a distinct spiritual light? So I think it's an interesting question to consider when we're thinking about the nature of that spiritual experience, about that transformation of the senses that's undertaken by Peter, James, and John. Well, there were others around Saul when he had that experience because he tells us about them in the 22nd chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. But first, we get a different account from his in the 9th chapter. So... In the ninth chapter, we hear that the men traveling with Saul heard the voice that Saul said he heard, Paul said he heard, but they didn't see anyone. Paul, later on, says they saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. So it's a total contradiction of account. But even on this second account, when others did see the light, Paul, who shared with them that sight of the light, was the only one who was blinded by that light. So either his spiritual vision, although they all saw the light, was different in quality than that perceived by the others, or perhaps it was the same, but simply the effect for him in particular was different. I don't suppose we can know. But nonetheless, it raises the question of what people see, whether that's the same, or whether if what they see is the same, it's the case that there are different effects for different seers. And that may depend on the preparedness of the person, the aptitude of the person, the characteristics of the person, many possible variables. Now, one way of interpreting all of this complexity is to suppose that the transfiguration is not properly speaking of the transfiguration of Christ at all. For Christ is only showing those around him who he always is in his full divinity and his full humanity, and his full glory, his great beauty, his eternal beauty. Instead of the transfiguration being of Christ, we can think of the transfiguration being of the senses of those with him. They're gifted with spiritual perception. And not only is it sight then that's transfigured or transformed into the spiritual state, but it's also hearing, and we might think as early proprioception. And then we might think the whole psychophysical being of each human there is transformed. The whole human organism is transformed. The whole human experiencing person is transformed at that point. And note that at that point, that great light 
leads into darkness and to stumbling, to that falling. Now on this, as we consider the image here, and I should note that, that what you see is a vertical line here through the image, is simply a, a chain holding a lantern. It's nothing to do with the image itself. This is from St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. It's the apse mosaic there. It's the first full depiction of the transfiguration in such a way that set the, the mode of showing the transfiguration for years to come. Um, and as you can read, it's from the, about the 6th century. Uh, I'm going to give an account of a figure called St. Andrew of Crete, a 7th century figure in a homily on the Transfiguration. And I wonder, as you hear this, if you would, to see what uh, of St. Andrew's words you can find in the image here. Uh, and I'll compare the two a little bit afterwards. St. Andrew of Crete writes, or speaks, these words. The apostles could not endure. The apostles here, uh, Peter, James, and John. So that, uh, there's Peter, um, there's James, and there's John. Uh, Elijah's top left, and this is Moses, and there's Christ. So uh, the apostles could not endure the radiance coming forth from the spotless flesh, brilliance that welled up from the divinity of the word, but they fell on their faces. In a complete, this is Keep on. In a complete departure from their natural functioning, they were overcome by heavy sleep and fear and shut off their senses. They ceased from all intellectual movement and completely lost all awareness of themselves. And so in that divine and invisible darkness, above all light, they mingled with God. By not seeing at all, they received the true gift of vision and made progress in experiencing without knowledge and excess of knowledge and so they were led to share in a wakefulness higher than all intellectual attention now, i want as i said to show how this account of saint andrew of crete is evident in the transfiction image transfiguration image here the apostles here are clearly in disarray but they continue note to look upon christ and see, in particular, how the light changes in that aureole or aureola around Christ, simply that light around him, sometimes called a, a mandala from the world, from, from an almond shape. But this is more like an egg than an almond, so I'll say uh, aureola. That aureola gets darker the closer it gets to Christ. And that inner ring, that darkest blue, is surely something like what Andrews describes as divine and invisible darkness, above all light, in which the apostles are gifted with vision of the divine. In this experience, recall, not seeing at all, they received the true vision, a wakefulness above intellectual attention. And we might recall here what we heard earlier from von Balthasar. This is an ecstatic experience outside the bounds of psychology. It's outside the bounds of psychology because it's a divine experience, because it's more than human. And the Sinai Monastery example we see here is just the beginning, as I mentioned earlier, of such a depiction through the centuries. Here's one at Daphne Monastery, which is a few miles outside of Athens. It's made about half a millennium later, somewhere around the turn of the 11th and 12th centuries. Also a mosaic. It shows the light of Christ as bright and yet as transcendent to all brightness. Dazzling, dazzling, dazzlingly dark here. Uh, as close, it's even darker perhaps than the one uh, at St. Catherine's, as closest to Christ. Now, 900 years later, there's the same visual principle in a depiction here of the risen Christ. The gradation of light in this aureola may be gentler, but that vision from light to dark in increasing nearness to the person of Christ is very clear. This is a wall painting by Aidan Hart, who I mentioned earlier, is, with whom we share a studio. Uh, Martin and I share a studio. Uh, and he, he painted it at the end of last year for a Roman Catholic church, uh, St. Edward's in Lees, LWS, near Oldham. And uh, it measures about eight metres wide by three metres high. So having got started with the account of the transfiguration, compared Paul's conversion, moved through from the 6th century to the 10th, 11th centuries here to the 21st century, um, I want to move out from the content of that image to 
its context because Aidan has put that image which is on the east wall of the church's sanctuary uh, within the Annunciation. So you see on the left here the angel Gabriel and on the right the Virgin Mary. Either side of this scene of the risen Christ. For it's in the Annunciation that humanity is united with divinity in the person of Mary. And through her son, the God, human, Christ, risen and with us to the end of time, as is written here, every human being is called to union with divinity. And so here the Annunciation speaks across the sanctuary space. Gabriel's hand is raised in a gesture not only of pointing towards Mary, but of, of voicing a visible sign of his voiced message so the Annunciation shapes the sanctuary space making it in fact a dynamically active space there's a, there's a voice going across it uh, there's a light within it a dazzling darkness within it and it's an invitation to insofar as the Annunciation flanks the risen Christ to say a yes like that of Mary so as to be present with the risen Christ and see how the risen Christ, now that the sanctuary furnishings are in place, stands at the altar. And here is the one who we meet at the altar. Christian believers meet at the altar in the bread and the wine, on which more shortly. So the main point I want to make here is that icons, uh, images within the liturgy, liturgical art, doesn't consist simply in separable units depicting persons and events. This liturgical art activates the space in which it's placed. So to take another example then, from the Daphne Monastery uh, to the image of the Transfiguration that we saw shortly ago, here's a mosaic of the Annunciation. Gabriel on the left, uh, Mary on the right. Now note how the Annunciation here works across the space of a squinch. Now squinch is simply uh, a weight-bearing arch that covers the space between a square angle in the building, such that you can rest, for example, an octagon or a circular piece of architecture upon a square one. So a little, a little large, a niche. Now the angel Gabriel here isn't then interacting with Mary across a flat plane or a flat space, but across the actual internal dynamic of the building itself. The space itself becomes alive. And note that the figures are not only facing each other, but because of the way they're placed within the whole church, they're also facing us. So that we're invited into that space. And as far as we enter into the church, we're in that space, constituted by their interaction. And note also how the gold tesserae here reflect the light in such a way as to form this radiant beam between the two figures. So there'll be a kind of shimmering light created by the slightly differently angled tesserae of the gold uh, that a person will see as they look up to encounter the event of the Annunciation. Now, in the transfiguration image in the same church, where that shimmering light is in the Annunciation, Christ is in the transfiguration. He is the light. So we can imagine then that any light falling here will fall uh, here reflected in the first, uh, not so much in the second, but nonetheless, Christ there, the source of light, the light of the world, bright before us and dazzlingly bright. Now, both of these accounts, the Annunciation and the Transfiguration, both talk of an overshadowing that follows the bright, then the dazzling light. Um, in the Annunciation we hear, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born with holy will be holy. He will be called Son of God. We recall from the Transfiguration, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice and so on. I think the cloud, I, I say I think, I mean this is written by theologians, um, you know, I can mention it if helpful later. This cloud suggests some kind of impressing or imprinting upon the person. Uh, it's a creative action that uh, changes a person, transforms a person. So we can think of this cloud as 
bringing a renewal of the human, a rebirth also. So the believer standing in the church before these images of the transfiguration and the annunciation is enfolded into a very spiritually charged space, recreative of their own person, uh, if they would accept that invitation. And it then appears that this art is something like installation art. It's art that works within the spatial context in which it's formed and placed, as distinct from merely a spectator art that's uh, two-dimensional and at a distance. I'm watching the time because I would say a little bit more about the nature of the gold. Um, but I'm not going to. I think I'll, 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 I'll skip that. But if that's something we might want to talk about, to say briefly that gold is a register of divinity so that these figures in the events into which they invite us are surrounded by divinity. And the gold is real gold. The glass tesserae are formed of three layers, a base layer of glass, then a gold leaf, and then a top layer of glass to protect that gold leaf. And they will be angled even up to 45 degrees around the wall space of the church in order that they're directed towards the person who sees them uh, within the church. So if it's a flat wall, for example, and it's high up, that might be a case where they're 45 degrees so that the reflected light comes down upon the person who looks up at them. Clean on a curved surface, that's not necessary. Uh, and then on a very uh, flat area, the, the wall might be gently undulated um, such that the, the light falls, falling on the undulating surface gives a diversely reflecting um, light back to the viewer. And if you can think, if you're walking through passing that kind of surface, as you walk, the light's going to change um, in accordance with the angle that you see that space from, and there'll be a kind of movement, a dynamic to the light within the hole. So everything is moving slightly. This uh, technique of using the uh, gold in such an angled way brings a dynamism, dynamism and activity to the space. But at this point, I want to go to uh, Kiev, uh, clearly uh, in the news. Um, and this cathedral, uh, Hagia Sophia, or Hagia Sophia, is in the center of Kiev. It's now a secular space. There, couldn't, there wasn't agreement about how it could be used. Uh, and I want to go to the work of uh, a figure called uh, Alexei Lidov. He's a Russian Byzantinist and um, who's recently... Uh, written about this particular space as follows. Look up in the uh, cupola here. And uh, what, what do you see at the top? More closely, uh, you see Christ Pantocrator, Christ Almighty, Christ All-Powerful. It's in an inverted cup, if you like, at the top of the dome. Now, I ask you to hold this... Uh, image briefly in mind as we follow his argument. Now, below this image of Christ Pantocrator, let's say Christ Almighty, below this image of Christ Almighty is whether the believer takes communion. And that is to say, she or he enters into union with Christ through his body and his blood. The Pantocrator kind of shapes the space in which she or he does so. Now imagine that the communicant takes the cup of wine, the blood of Christ, and that cup itself mirrors the shape of the cupola above. So there's a cup into which they look to taste the wine, and there's a cup above. So they're within a vertical axis that's created by church uh, architecture and the vessels of the sanctuary. Now, Lidoff then takes us to uh, a cup, a chalice, that's roughly contemporary to the Kievan mosaics. This chalice is originally from Constantinople. It's now in the treasury of San Marco, uh, likely taken there in 1204. Um, it's called the Chalice of the Patriarchs. And now look inside the chalice, and what do you see uh, at the bottom, the base of that chalice? And so what would you see in and through the wine as you drink through that chalice? Now, even if you can't recognize in detail that figure, I hope you might be able to pick out at least the outline of Christ Pantocrator there. Christ Almighty. 
It's made of uh, cloisonne enamel, um, and it forms part of the cup itself. So the believer sees that same image of Christ Pantocrata in the cup from which they drink as they see above them in the cupola. Christ above, Christ below, and they're drinking out of that cup, Christ within. And there we might fruitfully reflect on that psalmist words, taste and see that the Lord is good. Sight and taste brought into union with Christ. And just as an aside here, there's an interesting parallel with the mosaic imagery of the Aryan baptistry in Ravenna. As a person there goes to approach the water in the font, they will see reflected in that water what is above, and what is above is a depiction of Christ being baptised. So there, what's in the, the, the water itself provides the image of Christ's baptism simply by virtue of its reflection of what's above. Again, a vertical axis, heaven united with earth. And so here we are at the central sacraments of the church in which Christ fills the space above and below uh, and within. And in the context, context of Hagia Sophia and Kiev, at the least, the touch of the cup, the taste of the wine, the sound of the sung voices, the smell of the incense, the sight of the icon of Christ, they all engage and they all invite. The senses are heightened, intensified, extended, transformed in a total vision toward an experience, we are told, of a dazzling darkness confounding all human sense. The human becomes transcendent and blessed. Recalling the words of St. Andrew, without knowledge and excess of knowledge, above all intellectual attention, a wakefulness. It perhaps remains surprising that it is through the flesh, through the body, through the senses, that the very body, the very flesh and senses are transcended. But from the perspective that the word became flesh, became that is our flesh, with our human body and our senses, and from the perspective that we can be transformed through him and become divine, from this perspective it might ring true. And it seems fitting to end there, in the midst of this infinite process of transformation. Thank you very much.